today I have a piece of Bockingford tinted blue paper in front of me, 100% cotton. Before I turned on the video, before I started filming, I took the hake and I passed it over in this fashion with water. And so that was just about three minutes ago, so it was just um, kind of doing that off camera to uh, prevent time uh, accumulating in these videos. But I just wanted to show you again what was taking place. The reason I do that is um, to allow the paper to soak. Um, it absorbs it, we can do wet and wet, and then um, the paper itself stretches. This paper, I've talked about it before, the Bockingford, is not 100% cotton, it's 100% alpha cellulose, so it kind of reacts differently and settles differently. But um, the tinted aspect is what's really cool about it, so we use it once in a while in order you know, to have a little different effect. So today I don't have any particular composition in mind. I wanted to, well, I had a little bit of an idea of just a receding mountain range with, um, with a lake or a stream in front of it. And it's probably built off of yesterday's time lapse of a fountain pen sketch. Uh, I have the paper right here of Jasper Francis Cropsey's uh, Greenwood Lake. So if you look on YouTube, one of the most recent videos would be that. And it's going to be loosely based off of that receding idea. I find that um, looking at the master paint painters from the 1800s, the landscape painters, will give me compositional ideas, color ideas, uh, etc. So I sketch them in black and white. And that time that I spend staring at them will... Uh, Hopefully some things will start picking up and I'll start seeing things that I wouldn't notice just at glancing and flipping through a book. And plus I think it helps me build up my um, my tonal skills and uh, perspective, etc. So it's really fun. I used raw sienna, raw sienna just now. I'm grabbing some alizarin crimson. Most likely going to stick within the Ron Ranson palette. I'm gonna feed just some wet and wet in the sky. We'll let it play out. Prior to this, I was working on um, gouache portraits. So, about putting in a few hours of art time each day, and I've been working on gouache portraits. And after this, I think I'm going to do a time lapse trying an oil portrait. That'll be the first one I've done in like 13 years or something like that. I may follow a tutorial and just time lapse it. I've been looking at this fellow um, Upari artist. He has a lot of awesome free content of very in-depth oil painting with figures and uh, portraiture work. They're like hour long, two hour long videos. And he, um, I think he uploads at least once a week. I think he's located in Washington, DC. So really cool. Um, I haven't talked to the fellow, but seems very humble and very um, very passionate about teaching. So I'm just going to do a wet and wet um, foreground. Then I'll dry off and then start playing around with mountains and reflections and whatnot. This is ultramarine, mixing it with the raw sienna kind of like this muted tone down that I get with it. This is to just kind of map out my foreground. One thing I've really been, I, I guess, I don't know if it's um, common in the Hudson River Valley School painting or, or not, but a very slanted foreground in this fashion has been popping up a lot. I might be just gravitating towards those and sketching those, but 
one thing I noticed with their foregrounds, and it seems reflected in the teaching of a lot of contemporary painters, is to, of landscape, to not focus too much in the foreground. And that seems to hold apparent with the, um, the, the masters of the 1800s, where your eye isn't really drawn to the foreground, but when I'm sketching it, I'm like, oh man, there's just so much going on in it. But it's just kind of subtle tonal shifts, little directional line changes, might be rocks, things like that. But I, I think the closeness of the tonality prevents the eye from um, thinking that too much is going on there. So when they say that tone is the basis of art, or like kind of the most important thing, you start seeing things like that, and you think that you know, that's might be true. You know, it might be reasons like that help that. Um, I have noticed the one that I had sketched yesterday was cropped on the sides or framed on the sides by trees. Once again, very, very common that shows up over and over again. And that's preventing the eye from going off the page. It may also be that a lot of them were sketching in the same location, but I, I really do think that that's the, the purpose. This is Payne's Gray. I am um, a little hesitant about the dry off, and I'll tell you all why while I just uh, fiddle around right here. With foreground trees, I've been very fond of um, putting some wet and wet strong pigments in, and that'll diffuse within the wet and wet and then I'll come back over it and once it dries and utilize kind of like a stippling we use the hake we do that we get the contrast we get the softness and then we get the um, the texture of the dry brush over it to kind of give it depth but I also want to do a dry off and put the mountains in as a uh, wet on dry so Wonder how that's going to affect it. But so let's grab, let's grab some colors. We'll do a little bit of that softness that I'm talking about, and then interspersed between these, we'll play our mountains. So the purpose of this is to kind of just get my shapes of my foreground trees, which are going to ride along this ridge. The water will be back in here, and the mountains are going to sit in this range. Mountain range, heh. <laughs> oh, actually, um, I know there was a corny joke, but I was thinking about something. Um, I know this seems lame. I'm 34, and, you know, uh, it's not the, the Pledge of Allegiance. It's, uh, I forget the name of the song, which one it is. It's, you know, Our Country Tis of the, um, you know, the American song what I was thinking about was purple mountains majesty that line and purple mountains I don't think the mountains are really purple I think it's the whole concept that we have aerial perspective and I think that that song might be talking about aerial perspective within that line because as we recede back we use blue or purple for the farthest objects I don't know a little weird that's just the way Never mind, thanks. I'll probably post that on some um, painting Facebook page just to start a little conversation about it, see what people think. I'm just gonna um, get a little of this color down here. Make it a little interesting. So I put those in to frame it. I'm going to come in um, with more texture on top of it once we dry off. What I'm going to do now is take the blow dryer, dry it, and we'll start putting in our background mountain range.
looks like we're pretty dry. Um, you see how everything softened up, so I'll come back over it. But I'm going to take a number four rigger, which this is a silver black velvet brand. I've been starting to grow fond of this brush where it really helps me um, lay in more paint. I usually use the Hake and then the number one rigger, but I've been adding this as well, the Hake um, number one rigger and then the number four rigger. It just, like I said, helps me lay in more. Now I'm mixing up ultramarine and light red oxide for a uh, purplish color. This is a mixture that I learned in the very beginning, well, very close to the beginning, from um, books by James Fletcher Watson. So if you're a fan of Ron Ranson, which Hake Brush and things like that, that's where we kind of all originate that from. Um, you should check out James Fletcher Watson. He's really, really good. He, um, British painter, he, he passed away as well. Um, I think it started in the 40s or maybe earlier. But he has quite a few books out there on the market. You could find them for a very affordable price on eBay or Amazon. So you can find a lot of those things used. And, you know, it's just really good. He would take maybe, um, let's say Ron Ranson, let's say he would take 20, 30 minutes on a painting, if we said that. Um, James Fletcher Watson would take maybe an hour to two hours, I think. Um, he was a little bit more meticulous than Ron Ranson. However, um, they both were kind of pure watercolors, and I would say they were in the same school of painting. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, James Fletcher Watson had influenced Ron Ranson. So this was a very common uh, background hill, uh, mountain or hill color, those two mixed together. And what I'm going to do to speed things up, I'm going to dry my mountain shapes as I draw them so that they don't blend into each other. That's something that you might like, that might be something you don't like. Um, try it out and experiment between the two. What I'm doing is I'm just making up this mountain range. I'm trying to extend the line of this one a little bit lower to get it a little bit closer than this so we can start getting an S-shaped composition. In this stage as well, you can also take a little bit of um, raw sienna and feed that in and that will give different um, kind of effects within the mountain range. Maybe the idea of different faces, hills, groups of trees, etc. Unfortunately, so this one is from my imagination, but if you um, are working from a photograph, just think about those two different changes right there. It's kind of like a light and dark. Yesterday's study of James, um, my, yeah, Jasper Francis Cropsey, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling. I noticed uh, what I really liked about his was the light was um, kind of coming from the left, so these mountains were darker, the mountains on the uh, right side were catching it, and they were a little bit more warm. In fact, I wonder what it would be like to feed in a little bit of raw sienna. That's kind of one of the things you need to do with painting, is just ask yourself, what's the difference if I feed in raw sienna versus burnt sienna? Um, maybe even I, I lemon yellow back there, see what happens. This is raw sienna, very, a lot more pure. Let's see if we can get the effect of it catching light on these hills as opposed to these ones. Anywho, let's try these off and then we'll put a range behind it.
Once it's dry enough, I find that we can kind of just work in the next one. Now here, I'm just taking a wetter mixture of what I used before. And you can almost use it like a watermark where it's almost pure water. We'll see if we get the contrast. It might be a little too close to each other, but we'll see. You just vary your shape of your mountains. Uh, with this, we could once again maybe darken it a little bit just to put the idea that it has shadows. Okay. Now, on this other side, we are experimenting with uh, potentially having light on it. So into this very, very, very watery mix, I think the camera is catching it. A little bit of raw sienna. And we'll see if we can get the illusion that this aspect of the mountains will catch some light. So the number seven, sorry, number four rigger, I don't know why I said seven, seems to hold a lot of um, water, as you can tell. And I'm not really tickling or picking at it, it just helps me get a little more of a crisp line. There's a little bit of dark in there. I may have overdone it, but Let's see what happened. Now, since we're dry in front, I'm going to put a land mass there. Ultramarine blue, light red oxide. So I'm making my purple again. It's in a stronger concentration. And then I'm going to mix the raw, uh, sorry, burnt sienna in to warm it up. So this is going to be a closer mass right here. I'm just carrying it through the trees that we're gonna see it but I'm gonna wind up passing over those guys this is experimental in itself for me like I had said with the wet and wet the dry off and then kind of painting around it because I wanted to do the wet on dry for those mountains I'm gonna put a little bit more raw sienna down here nope, let me grab some Payne's gray let me get some variety there okay now this side this guy's wet right here and I wanted to have a closer mountain range to bring it around. So I'm gonna do a quick dry off. So like I said, I want to bring it around this way. I want it to be stronger in color. Here's ultramarine with uh, raw sienna. I recently used a razor blade to pick up my ultramarine off my um, palette and move it to another spot. And I feel like there was, because it was too close to the phthalo blue, I think I might have caught a little bit of phthalo blue right there. So green does seem a little seems to be a little greener than I want it to be. So let's see. Ultramarine blue. Raw sienna. There we go. Make another mix. Alright, so this guy is going to be a mountain that's closer. Or a hill that's closer.
pass behind this tree mass. And it's so close that we're going to have variation in it. You're going to see um, shadows and other guys going on, trees, whatnot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give one more mass in front, right in here. wet and wet. I'm going to pass a little bit of reflection down. I don't want to do any ref water reflection yet, but I feel like I need to to start establishing this. Okay, I'm going to take some uh, burnt umber, ultramarine, Like I said, I think I might be grabbing some thalo blue, so if it seems a little, um, I call it kind of like a mentholated green, thalo blue and those guys kind of mix to that, that feel for me. Now that's wet right there from that pass I just done, I can feed in a little bit. And we'll be done with the water in the mountains in a moment, and then we'll put a lot of thought into the foreground. Though, like I said, we don't want too much detail in the foreground because we want to be able to look into the picture and see everything else, but it's going to take place. It's um, paints gray. Okay. Good night. All right. While we're there, we could even take almost like pure water and feed in another mountain back in here. Just keep your hills rolling if you want. You can do as many of those as you want. All right, so um, let's dry this off. We'll do our water and then we're gonna do four around. Take a play from James Fletcher Watson and utilize Payne's Gray as water. more in there just a little reflection from that and this feed some more in if we want
There we go. Okay. Now it is time for foreground. So I'm going to take my hake and grab some raw sienna. I'm going to use it now as a dry brush to get textured effects. effects. gray to darken it up. Now with this dry brush effect, you may want to do a dry off between applications. Reason being is it'll start doing wet and wet and it'll start spreading. So you do want to uh, be a little random with it, but also stay controlled. Also want to add a dark in this region as the shadow and let that blend in to the shadow underneath and kind of give myself a little ridge line of um, shadows. So it comes up into the mass, then it also blends in and shows up down here. And I'm just going a little wacky with this just to get some different textures, just uh, different movement. Raw Sienna. Payne's Gray. Every so often you might need to grab a little bit more water, but it's only like a smidgen. Just maybe dip just one hair of the hake brush into the water just to get a little bit more on the palette. But it's just let loose and have fun. Yep, I'm definitely picking up phthalo blue, so I'm going to uh, amend this to saying that it's Ron Ranson palette and phthalo blue. Which is fine at this point. I do like phthalo blue more towards the foreground and ultramarine more in the background. Once again, this is on the blue tinted paper, which I feel like the tinted paper gives me a fruity pebble look. I usually paint very dark and tonal, as you may know, like kind of dark moody stuff. Once I utilize tinted paper, it um, just gives a different effect. Let me, um, here's my number one rigger. And I'm just going to get a dark. This is just burnt umber, Payne's gray. Then we'll start adding branches and trunks in. Then we'll do a dry off. Then we'll cool them over a second time. Having this paper relax is an issue for me. You see, it's kind of, um, I'm not sure how well it shows up, but you might see how it's buckling quite a bit. Now, um, I've had recommendations of heavy weight on top of it after it's done. Also, iron the back of it. I haven't gotten around to trying any of those things. I've been um, mainly just focusing more on the, the painting end, and like I said, a lot of focus on um, experimenting with portraiture. Uh, later on tonight, I think it's going to be the delve into oil painting portraiture. Um, so there's a lot that's been going on art-wise. That's also a good segue into my spiel. 
Hey, down below I have a link to my Patreon account. I would love for you to consider supporting me on Patreon. If you are unable to, or unwilling to, that's totally understandable. And no hard feelings. Just watching, liking, subscribing is, you know, helpful for me. So, um, also, if you ever have any questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to, you know, make them down below and I will uh, try to address them. I love hearing from y'all. Y'all are always welcome to follow any of these paintings and I would love to see the results that you guys wind up having. And if you do follow it and somebody says, hey, I love that painting, I'd like to buy it from you. You have my permission to go ahead and sell that, you know? So go ahead, feel free to you know, paint along, feel free to sell it if, um, helps you you get supplies and all that stuff and you know that's that's the goal here is just um to help promote you all in that fashion and help you all in that way i do feel like foreground wise we need something in this area we could add a um a rock structure this is just taking the rigor and just drawing it in Payne's Gray. This is burnt umber. This is just adding more texture and variety to this foreground. But everything's kind of staying in the same tonal range. Payne's gray mixed in to darken these guys. In fact, let's get some uh, lemon yellow. Let's get some green in here. And you could play all day in this foreground. You could add another tree in front. We might wind up doing that. Um, but, you know, have fun, experiment, and see what you can come up with and how you can create that depth of field. fact, number four rigor, I want a lot of pigment here, so I'm just picking up what I can, Payne's Gray, Burnt, Umber, Ultramarine, which, like I said, a little bit of Thalo Blue, connected to it, and we're going to draw a tree. Have somebody branch off of it. helping seat this within it so I'm just dry brushing 
on the side so you can get really great texture effects with riggers. So between the rigger and the hake, if you're doing fast and loose, that's all you really need. But um, we all know that we buy a lot of art supplies. In fact, um, I'm working on getting together an order for Blick.com. I need uh, more paper. I need um, some small brushes for the portrait work, like the um, in the figure painting. Uh, I also need another sketchbook for the inks. There's a lot of stuff. And that's why I always make that kind of plea for um, for patrons. I also do try to provide uh, free content, uh, sorry, exclusive content for um, patrons. Anyway, I'm gonna mix this dark again. Then I'm gonna try to grab it with uh, the rigger now and just put that in as foliage. So let's grab some of that right there. So this is foliage for the very foreground. I think I want to order another number four since I've been using it with um, the gouache. I have been reading that you apparently don't want to really interchange the brushes too much. One might be harsher on it than the other. I'm not sure. I just want to get dark. And then you can play around with this as much as you want. You can tell the difference now between the um, the number four and the number one and see how they both have their uses. This one's very um, you know, finer than the other. I don't know if the, yeah, probably just has to do with um, the thickness of the tip itself. Yeah, there is a visible difference, yeah. Sometimes you'll have, uh, if you have Chinese brushes, they could be like ginormous, but still come to a nice fine tip. So it may just be uh, a difference in manufacturing philosophy between the two uh, painting schools, between Western painting and, um, I guess you'd say Eastern, Middle uh, Asian. You could always put little people in here fishing and whatnot in this region. You could always put boats in the water. Um, you know, anything that you'd want to play around with. So I'm not sure how much time we've spent on this one, but I'll start wrapping it up and then we'll put a mat over it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. I would love to 
guys. And we'll hear back from y'all. I'd love to see all those results. Like I said, if y'all follow along, it's Friday evening, so I think there'll be a lot of people painting this weekend. Well, I hope you all enjoyed. Let's dry it off. We'll sign it, put a mat over it, and say we're done. So toss on top. And there you have it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed, and I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day. Bye.